Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Breath of Fire 2. Last episode, we went over even more ways to bust up the game, recruit Ds, cook stat-boosting Vigor items for Ryu, all that good stuff. And today, we are going to further the main plot and try to look for a grass man to figure out what's happening. And here... I searched the whole world map so I could point out our next destinations as we went to them. Probably won't do that too much in the future since it bloats up the time lengths and all that, but I did it for this episode. Joining me today is Skyzo. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Hello, YouTube. Alright, so before we enter this next place, we need to make it daytime! And then, we can enter the carnival and pay a hundred zenny to get inside. Now, this location is something we could have visited all the way at the beginning of the game, but... Back then, it wasn't plot relevant, just had some amusing flavor text here and there, as well as some surprisingly well-written riddles, even for the original translation, but... It wasn't necessary, this game's long enough as is, so I saved it for here when the grass man would become relevant, because it turns out they're gonna feed the grass man to a horrible monster, a bloodthirsty one. Even Watts the Quizmaster is a little freaked out about this, so you want to recruit him before this episode ends if you plan to. So you can see his riddles and get the only hint in the game you get as to where Dees can be recruited. So. Make sure you do that. I'm not going to, because I already know how. Right, so... When you come here, and there's not really much going on, I imagine that you're blocked at the entrance. No, well, you can pay. I think it's just like 10 zenny or something, but you can check out everything. That's interesting. And so this is the grass man? Yep. It's more of a grass woman. That is actually the subject of some debate. I'll get more into that later, but not right now. Anyways, I guess the grass man has gotten boring, so... Apparently the best idea he has is to just have him be devoured in front of a live audience. Doesn't seem like a terribly efficient use of resources, I mean... At that point, why not go full Michael Vick? I mean, seriously. That is a very bizarre motivation for doing something like that. Yeah. Maybe he's just not a very good uh, ringmaster. What do you think, Skyzo? I'm not really sure I can wrap my head around this character. I don't know why he thinks anyone would fork over 900,000 zenny for this guy. Oh yeah, that's a reach. Funny thing is, you can actually afford that with the trade glitch I showed all the way back in the prologue, or even the infinite gold brick trick that we showed in the first bonus episode. It saves you a dungeon crawl, actually, so any percent runs actually do that, but you still have a boss fight to fight at the end, so it doesn't matter that much. What does matter is this speed suit that only Sten and Bosch can wear. These are weightless pieces of equipment. Even the basic cloth, I think, has at least three weights to it, or two. So this is super important for Sten, because he's almost there. He's almost to where he consistently outspeeds things, but not quite, so every little bit helps. If you can afford it. If not, you can just get it later. And I think the next episode. That's nice. It's always amusing when you can buy an item that you're not really supposed to or intended to in a game. I actually recall trying to cheat and get like infinite money in Pokemon Red. Right, so I can buy the, the bicycle when you're not supposed to, but... Well, that was never programmed, so nothing happened. Yeah. I, I think... It requires a seven-digit number, and the game only goes up to six digits, right? Yep, although you can, I think you can have a seven-digit number in money, but it's not going to display properly. Ah. Uh, 
Always the rub. Anyway, this is where we really break the game, even with all of our self-imposed limitations, because we are gonna buy a whole bunch of fire spices. They're like items that cast fire blast each time you use them. Only thing is, you can only use them once, and you can't stack them in your inventory, so they cost some money and take up a lot of inventory, but trust me, it is totally worth it if you're not using Dece or the second tier dragons. Also, make sure to deposit all your money before leaving. We're doing the game's last death warp in this episode. And now we have this guy here. The Marble Golem. He hits fairly hard, but spends most of his time defending. And more importantly, he has only one Vigor, so instead of fighting him, we just run. And even if he somehow kills someone, it doesn't matter. You can just revive him easily at an inn or when you go to township, so no big deal. It's convenient. Yeah. And let's see what we cook. Oh, yes. We're gonna cook ourselves one, two gold bricks. Just two, though. We can't buy turbocharges like we could if we recruited Hans, so we're gonna avoid the worst abuses of this trick here, because the turbocharges were the only easily available stat boosters we had. Technically, you could keep cooking gold bricks, but it requires going back and forth between goons and cooking battle items. It's like a three-step process that can fail at each point, so it's just a pain in the neck. What isn't a pain, though, is cooking some biscuits or hardtacks with these thunder rods. These hardtacks? Do you remember I was telling you about them, Skyzo? I don't think so, although... Yeah, there was like a, a small cutout when you were talking about the fire spices, so I may have missed it. No. No, I didn't. Don't worry. Anyways, the biscuits, or hard tacks, completely heals all characters, as it says in the description. But it also grants you a small 1.2 times multiplier to your defense as you're doing it. By the way, visiting that well was important for a plot trigger, more on that later. For now, since I turned Sten into a red monkey, I want to talk about the downsides of fusion, since I haven't covered that before, and... And by the way, we got a fast food from that closet, use that on Sten, again, borderline. But yeah, as good as it is, you can lose it very, very easily. You can lose it whenever you drop below 30% HP, and you don't get it back until you go back to Township and redo the fusion. But the other thing is that for some weird reason, there are certain cutscenes that automatically deactivate them. So we don't actually get much of a chance to use it. It's a little strange. I mean, they, they could just have it so that when you fall below 30% HP, it deactivates, but you don't have to redo the whole thing every time. And the thing of it is, Breath of Fire 1 actually got around that by having you just being able to redo it outside of battle. So, first of all, we have two Sirens. Pretty vanilla enemies, not so bad. Only thing is, they have Dream Breath, so they can troll you a little bit, and they have Cyclone, fairly weak, but it doesn't wake you up, so... They can be a little annoying, but they're not actually too hard. Just hit them over the head with melee attacks, job is done. Seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Annoying, but straightforward. No jolt to contend with, anyway. And as for Sten, I think if you're playing the Game Boy Advance version, this is the point where he just outspeeds all the relevant enemies outright, since he has the extra levels and all that. Not here, though. 
By the way, make sure to get that quarter staff. It's gonna be Lean's last upgrade for a pretty long while. This is about the point where physical attacks start going by the wayside, and Lean becomes more useful for her speed than anything. And Sten uses mostly magic. For example, Sten has Fire Blast right now, but instead we shall use a Fire Spice! Ah, oh, yeah. Wow, that's insanely strong. I imagine we, we're gonna use that with bosses, right? Oh, yes. Now, most of the enemies here, except for the Siren and the boss at the end, are weak to fire, which is why it was so strong. And actually, a lot of the enemies in this game are weak to fire, so essentially... Cat sort of becomes like Nina, except fast instead of slow, and between her and Sten, they can trivialize a lot of encounters before they get to move. Like I said, this is about where the game really starts getting easier. Not that it's like a joke or anything like that, it's just, compared to say, the very start, there's a clear difference. It's nice, although it's a little sad that the game isn't better balanced, I suppose. Hmm, it is. Also, Sten, 68 Vigor, I think that's about two points away from where he needs to be to always outspeed things, which is good because we have the most dangerous encounter here, the three fallen elves. They have a chance of going before Sten if you get bad speed rolls, and they almost die to one fire spice or fire blast but not quite not consistently anyway so since i don't like wasting them i tend to have lean use attack while sten uses fire blast and he well casted that one so he crit and killed them all anyway but normally two or one of them would have survived and gotten a chance to do some physical attacks Two of them usually won't kill anyone, but three of them on the same target, they just might. So it's good to have Fire Blast and Fire Spices for that. Or just bring Dece along, that works too. It's very convenient that most of the enemies here are weak to fire, right? Oh yeah. And uh, I mean, I wonder just like, I don't know why that is, why most enemies are weak to it. Well, I think there's a lot of creature types in, like, D&D, &D, where fire type just ends up being the way to go. Some of them use ice, some aquatic enemies, you can argue, are weak to fire. There's zombies, there's undead things, even steel types in Pokemon. Whereas ice, in comparison, it's just like, use it on fire guys, and what else would be weak to ice? That's true. It's just one of those things that, I mean, really, what's going to resist it besides, like, a magma uh, golem or something? Exactly. Anyway, this guy is a weird one. This is a guy that attacks via nothing but counters. If you just defend, he will never lay a finger on you. Ever. Possibly because it's just an innocent creature trying to go about its business. It also never crits on counterattacks, which is the case for everyone, actually, so this actually makes him a very convenient target for another Death Warp, and the very last one, well, not the very last one, there's one in the end game, but the last one you're gonna see for a while, so it's weak to Thunder, so I could almost kill it with a Thunder Whelp, and it wouldn't even counter since you can't counter magic. But instead, we're going to use it to soften us up a bit. Make life easier. At least in the short term. And yeah, see how Sten lost his fusion there? The stat bonus has just gone away. I see that. And if I weren't doing this... Actually, I have to readjust my equipment for uh, MC Tusk or the Ringmaster anyway, but... Not in quite the same way as I would if I was just trying to kill myself fast as possible, so... It's nice to have this guy with a boatload of attack to speed us further off the mortal coil. 
For a time, anyway. And there we go. Got him. What did you think of that, Skyzo? Still baffling to me how strong those dragon spells are. <laughs> also, I had this... I was wondering, like, does the fence account for both magic defense and physical defense in this game? Unfortunately not. As far as this game goes, there really is no real defense against magic attacks, or nothing significant, anyway. The closest you have is... Well, by the way, you want to stand in front of this exact hole, or uh, one to the upper right. If you leave this room and come back, you'll actually get two items from that chest instead of just Cloud's Buster Sword. I don't know why that is, why the other holes just give you the Buster Sword, but it is what it is, so make sure to take advantage of that. But yeah, anyways, you have elemental equipment for resisting certain types of magic, and you also have the Wisdom stat, but the only thing the Wisdom stat really does is it affects the bonus that the enemy spellcasters have. Like, compare your Wisdom stat to the enemies, and the enemies could either do the base amount of damage, slightly above that, slightly below that, and so on. But it's so small, it may as well not exist, so... Technically, there's a magic defense stat, but functionally, the answer is no, there is not. Oh, okay. By the way, Skyzo, guess which exact defense stat you want before this next boss fight. <laughs> You'll never guess what it is. Yep, that's 69. Yep, it's 69! Because this boss just happens to have 168 attack. And the lowest benchmark for the high formula, which reduces the effects of the attack stat, just happens to be 99. 168 minus 99 is 69. Is that not logical, Skyzo? Is it not? That's nice. Convenient for us, <laughs> for sure. Easy to remember. Yeah, it's just one of those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty then. Let's get ready to rumble! Oh, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you let the Upa Rupa go or not. You just have to meet it, beat it up, then it begs for mercy, and then you can just come back empty-handed and tell the ringmaster to go stuff it. Or you could deliver the Uparupa, but then you don't get the Buster Sword or Defender. Nice, so I wonder how difficult this is gonna be. Ah. Uh, well, regardless, make sure that Ryu is in the back, and Rand is the one in the front since he has the most HP, and Make sure you have some Wisdom Seeds on hand, cause Fire Whelps are gonna be a blast here. And yes, in case you were wondering, you always have to fight this guy no matter what you do, whether you give him the Uparupa or the money. I feel like every time we've met somebody with this sprite, they turn out to be a demon, like every single time. Well, there's Kilgore. He was nice. Yeah, I guess. I mean, he made Bosch an outlaw, but hey, nobody's perfect. Anyways, this is gonna be a very short battle. Just uh, spam Fire Spices, Fire Blast, and Flame Whelp. And I think Rand also uses a Wisdom Seed on Ryu to restore a bit of AP, so we can get another fully charged Fire Whelp on the second turn. And don't mind the dialogue, it's just a regular melee attack. And yeah, that did actually a fairly little damage due to the special preparations I did. I think if I hadn't known about that formula, it'd be more like 76 or something. That's quite significant. Indeed. Let's see. Oh, another fire spice. Lean will vitamin whoever needs it. 
And now we're going to see the only trick that this ringmaster has up his sleeve. Rage! It just does 48 non-elemental damage to everyone. Not too big of a deal. It's about as strong as Terrapin's attack. Oh, so it just does fixed damage. Yeah. That's not too bad at all. Yeah, so basically just keep your health up and spam fire attacks for two turns. He won't quite be dead, but he's outsped by Sten and Lean, so this fight is in the bag. It's very easy. Yeah, it sort of is. I know that kind of goes counter to my theory that I espoused in the whale episode, but... Eh. Uh, trends are trends. They're... Not an exact science. That's true. Yeah. Also, I made sure to have Sten in the second slot, because this is one of my favorite lines. One of the most unique lines from him, especially compared to the other guys, who are either like, What the heck is happening? Why are all these demon guys running around everywhere? Or some variation of, He was gonna feed him? Ugh, who would do that? I feel like, yeah, I feel like that would be the most common reaction as well, and you wouldn't see a, a whole lot of self-reflection like that. Indeed. Like, it kind of points to uh, Sten's past. Oh, by the way, the grass man just got out. There was a trick door on the back that the ringmaster somehow didn't know about. So that's nice. Or not, depending on how you look at it. So you could have just not gotten in there in the first place. Yeah. No one said the ringmaster was very competent. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Anyways, Aspara, he knows something weird is going on with the forest, but he can't tell what it is. The giant eye. You know, it's creepy and all, but we don't know if it's really doing anything. We need to talk to the Elder Tree and find him. And make sure you go to the left from here. I'm not sure if party chat covers that or if anything else does, so make sure you don't forget that. I mean, maybe the game will remind you some other ways, but I wouldn't bet on it. Anyways, there's our next side quest. Oh, this is just a side quest? Well, side quest as in divergence. We'll call it a divergence. I mean, we don't want to do it, but the game does. That's fair enough. Now, here's something really weird. Aspara cannot equip wristbands, and yet he's equipped with one. So, if you replace that with something else, you'll never be able to put it back on her. The weakest you can equip is an iron band. It's weird. What? That's just a... That is a bizarre bug. I know! I can't make this up! <sighs> well... Anyways, let's go over Aspara himself. So, out of all the characters I'm not making regular use of, he is the closest one to being really good. Like, first of all, he's level 12, and he has three-digit HP, and he's a spellcaster. Like, he is way stronger than any spellcaster should be. And he has a boatload of AP, too, so at first glance, he seems pretty sweet. The big problem, though, is that he is slow. And unlike Nina, he has very little in the way of attack magic. He just has Frost, which does 40 damage to a single target, and that is it. Unless you recruit a certain tenant who's much later in the game, but... That's not worth it. He replaces someone else useful, too. So, Aspara mainly relies on debuffs like Blunt, Slow, Weaken, Silence, etc. Which are inconsistent at best, because 1. You can't look up what an enemy's magic resistance is, and 2. A lot of them 
Zeke sort of resist magic anyway, so if you bring him along, he sort of ends up being this wet noodle who can heal you up, but doesn't really do much of anything. But the big thing about him is he gets warp and exit at levels 18 and 19. So we do want to get him up at some point at a grinding spot, if y'all know what I mean. And then we'll have exit and warp on one character, which means we can fast travel finally at long last and exit dungeons. Um, the Uparupa cave, for some reason, exit is disabled there, so even Nina or Deese couldn't have helped us out there. So, if you want to level him up at some point, he can do some stuff occasionally, but for the most part, he's going to be spending time on the bench. Actually, I think it's a she. I say that because, well, I don't know if what the Japanese says. I know the fan translation always uses him, his, he, all that, but I don't know if that's just because he didn't want to refer to him as it or they or whatever. And first of all, as Skyzo mentioned, he has kind of a feminine appearance, even has sort of a grass skirt, she. But the big thing is that he has a fusion transformation if you join him with Sesso the Water Shaman, and he actually turns into this little mushroom girl with pink hair and everything like that. Even the official art seems somewhat flirty, I guess? Maybe just confident? I don't know, I mean... It, it seems like he... Or she leans more heavily towards she, but he's she's a plant, so probably the technical answer is non-binary, but I'll ask Ryusui about it on Twitter, and in any case, this is Fiona Day Questers signing out. Have a nice day, everyone, and God bless you. All right, so see you later, YouTube. Bye!